Well, good afternoon, everybody. I want to welcome you to this Wednesday's Lunchtime Hot Topics, January 18th of 2017. We have uh, uh, excited to get this spring semester rolling. Within this, we are going to visit a little bit about the quarter three training under the new accreditation model, KISA. Just want to remind everybody that this is what we're calling zero year. This is our year for everybody, hopefully, to get a good understanding of what the KISA framework is, <clears throat> all the different components, and then have a, a strong understanding by the end of this school year, going into the 17-18 school year, what year does your district want to enter this system? Is it year one, you're ready to do your needs assessment because it's been a long time since your district has ever gone through that process? Or maybe it, your district went through a very meaningful needs assessment a year or two ago and you've selected some goals and you just want to spend the next two, three years really implementing some strategies and some uh, objectives that you've been working on. So. That's our goal for zero year, understanding the, the framework of KISA and where you want to enter the 17-18 school year. And then finally, we're going to give you an update on evidence-based interventions. And again, I'm excited about where the board's headed this year. I'm excited about all the opportunities and the initiatives that we have in place over the next uh, couple of lunchtime hot topics. We're going to be providing you some more details about some programs and initiatives on how we're working to get you some resources on how do you teach interpersonal and intrapersonal skills. We have a contract with a group out of KU that will be leading that effort. At the same time, we have districts out there right now still piloting the or actually we have a host of high school seniors taking the transition to college algebra. We'll be providing some updates here pretty quick on how the kindergarten readiness pilots going using the ages and stages. And then obviously um, we've got state assessments right around the corner. So over the next couple weeks on the lunchtime hot topics. We're going to be giving you some pretty detailed information about some other initiatives. Again, at any time, send your questions or answers or topics that you'd like us to cover to lunchtime at ksde.org. We're excited again about where we're headed. The fourth quarter of the KISA rollout will actually be Randy and I. We're going to plan a tour across the state in late spring, probably around the month of April. We're getting those scheduled right now where Randy and I are going to come out, do that fourth quarter, but more kind of wrap up this year and really answer some questions. And Randy is going to help set the vision of where we believe everyone should be going for next year and how we can support you as a state. Thank you. Hello, Kansas. This is Scott Myers again, here with the latest and greatest on the lunchtime hot topics. Today's topic for me at least is around the quarter three rollout of the new accreditation system, which takes effect as hopefully you're well aware of, uh, July 1 of 2017. Um, if you've been or if you've attended any of the rollout sessions over the past half year, uh, you know that we're working from this uh, guidebook that's been created by Kelly Slayton and Bill Bags Bagshaw here at the KSDE. Uh, and it is set up in the third quarter just like it was set up in the first quarter. So you'll be able to see there's the table of contents. And much of this at the beginning, I'm just going to fly through because it is a repeat of previous uh, guidebooks. That said, it is all very important, so please take the time to come back through it to familiar, familiarize yourself with it as you need more information. So, table of contents set up like it has been in the past. 
of course, the work that we're doing uh, all emanates from the vision of the state board and their outcomes as they're listed on the screen here. Um, and of course, working into this uh, to hone our efforts, uh, we're trying to ensure that we uh, are producing successful high school graduates who have certain characteristics about them. And of course, that really is the work of the accreditation system. You know, it's supposed to be pulling toward creating these successful high school graduates so as to have a positive impact on the outcomes leading toward the vision of our state board. Uh, we are in quarter three, and as you see on the screen, this is the booklet, quarter three booklet, highlighted in gold. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, just how these slides work, up in the right-hand corner always is the key individual for you to contact if you have some information, have some questions or comments, email addresses, phone numbers. Uh, then also, oftentimes, there are uh, links on each slide that'll take you to pertinent information uh, for this particular link happens to be uh, as we're getting ready to come out into the field uh, well this week uh, the different places where we'll physically be so you're welcome to attend and of course you're welcome to attend as many as these as, as you'd like uh, by no means are these um, opportunities required by any means whatsoever but you are welcome to be there we'd love to see you love to hear what you have to say so that's where the, how a person registers to come to a different training. Uh, in the third quarter, we are focusing our attention uh, on this column right here. If you'll recall from the last several uh, months, this is organized by topics. We have these topics run throughout the entire year as we work through our uh, zero year, stakeholder information, the model information, the rubrics themselves, and then so on as it goes down. Uh, this particular quarter, we're right in here and talking about discrete pieces that are on time and needed now to, for us to move forward. Uh, so in the rest of this particular uh, presentation, we'll detail and roll around those. Uh, as you recall, the purpose of these hot topics are not to provide the, the entire full-blown uh, workshop experience. That's why we're coming out and spending two, three or so hours with you. This is just a general overview, but it does definitely give you an opportunity to watch it and rewatch it and listen to my golden tones yet one more time uh, and formulate questions. So the first area of this, let me go back a slide. I'll go back two slides rather. Uh, we're working on organizing stakeholder teams during this, this particular quarter. Talks about the district leadership team, the building leadership team and the uh, building site councils. You know, they're meeting. Well, here's the kind of things they should be talking about. If you've heard me talk about this previously, uh, one of just basic beliefs I have uh, within leadership is the worst reason in the world to have a meeting is because the calendar says to. Uh, when I was in the field, the site council meetings, leadership team meetings that really didn't go anywhere were the ones where I didn't really have an agenda. You know, it just kind of came together. That's nice to say hello, but it needs to have topics that were germane and substantive. Well, that's what this information here is about. It's talking about things to talk about with your different leadership teams. And like, likewise, uh, some items that are pertinent to the third quarter rollout uh, that are good to be discussed with the site councils as well. So take a look at those. And obviously in the guidebook, this is all flushed out a little bit more. Step two, we're actually talking about the needs assessment now, this, this, this go around. Uh, a little added uh, benefit to the third quarter, our friends from the KPLT, the Kansas Professional Learning Team, uh, they come together, I think quarterly uh, throughout the school year. They've been doing this for a couple of years. And they put their best thinking together to come up with actual activities that would be pertinent and helpful to the field as you address certain elements of whatever we're talking about. And today we're talking about KISA. Uh, and this particular piece of it is how to conduct the needs assessment. Well, on this slide, you'll see there's a link and it talks about this activity. Uh, if you are attending the sessions in person, it's at this point that the KPLT members from across the state will take the microphone and lead everyone in a workshop which will help everyone get a better understanding of how to go back through the needs assessment. You know, how do we know what we're going to address unless we know what our needs are? Well, first step on that is to go through uh, acti an activity of sorts to uh, help determine the, the, those efforts. 
across the state of Kansas for a couple of years now, different systems are in different spots uh, with all this work. And some systems uh, have developed uh, their own way about going and doing this. And as the service centers have done this as well. So this particular activity is not the only one you can do. You, know, you create your own, uh, tap, uh, call your friends, see what they've done, uh, or feel free to use this one. It's just purely uh, ideas on how to go about uh, conducting your needs assessment. Now, the next area that'll be uh, in, the, in the workbook rather is, we've talked about multiple times, is the concept of, well, where do I enter into the system of KISA? You know, one of the number one questions I, I receive from the field is, when will you, Scott, when will you tell me where we are entering the system? Well, I'm here to tell you again, I'm not going to tell you where to enter into the system. My answer is going to be is, what does your needs assessment tell you? You know, what, what, what is your, uh, what's your data show? So going through this activity, the one on the previous slide, will help you determine where you are entering the system. Um, I, I believe the vast majority of the systems in the state of Kansas will enter in group five, meaning they'll start their work doing the needs assessment next year, and then five years later have the actual accreditation visit. That said, I also believe, and I, oh, I know, uh, that we will have systems coming in in these other groups as well. I, I'm, I'm convinced, and rightfully so, that we'll have several uh, systems ready for their accreditation year next year uh, because they've been engaged in this work for several years now. So, uh, but it's from your deep dive at home that will help determine that piece of it. A, another activity which will fuel the previous chart is this next one, which I'm sorry, I went too fast, sorry about that. Uh, this activity is the figuring out well, where am I on all these different things that have to take place? Uh, there's a, um, I call it the green sheet on our website, which actually details um, what things should be taking on one nice clean document, uh, all the steps through the first year, the second year, the third year, the fourth year. Well, this activity will help, uh, help you determine, you know, how far you are at this point in the five year cycle. So please feel free to utilize this activity. And once again, Nothing says you have to. Uh, you're welcome to use some other uh, approach. You just be well advised that you do have a process uh, that helps you determine where you're best fit this, the cycle. Also this quarter, it's important to start talking a little bit more so about the outside visitation team. Uh, the outside visitation team, previously we had called the outside validation team, but we got to thinking about that. And it's not that we, this team is supposed to be coming out and oh, uh, checking on you and grading you. And that's not the case at all. It, it's meant to come out and help and coach and mentor and support what the district or the system has been doing. And so as we speak, the uh, service centers, you know, we're partnering with the service centers as we do in so many activities, are in the process of gathering up um, opportunities and names for people to come and become a part of the OVT, to get trained rather, to serve on an OVT. I would strongly encourage um, systems to have central office, building administration, classroom teachers, uh, get people involved in this, in that uh, it'll not only helps your neighbor, but all those good ideas and whatnot that people will see and learn out in the field, they'll be able to bring home. I, uh, of course, having been sat in the chair for a period of time, you have to think about the pragmatics, you know, things like travel and you know subs and whatnot. I, I understand that completely. As far as the time commitment goes, uh, it's you know basically maybe a day, maybe two days a year uh, for a member. Now, if a person's serving as a chair, there's a little bit more of a time commitment, uh, but in my mind's eye, that's an investment in time that's well worth the, the, its effort. Uh, some aspects or characteristics of uh, ideas behind the OVT, uh, the experience uh, should have, the members should have relevant experience, uh, meaning they should be in the educational setting or uh, system. Uh, it's not proper for myself, let's say, to serve on an OVT for a district if I'm working for that same district. Uh, it just would be a conflict of interest. 
so we want arm's length as well. And we will have conflict of interest um, sheets for people to fill out. Uh, expectations for these individuals are listed on the screen here. But basically, it's learn about the system, be willing to go out and work with other people, um, and then take those good ideas back home. And once again, there will be training um, being offered soon. The, the, uh, the sign-up sheet's already out there, where if a person says, well, I, I don't know anything about that, that's okay. Come to the, the training and learn about it. Uh, a, a very solid document has been put together, uh, a workbook, if you will, that is goes so far as to it'll give ideas on what types of questions or what exact questions to ask while doing a, a site visit. And so, uh, and what data to look for and how to write it up. And so by no means is a person going to be left out alone in the woods to figure this out. It's not the case at all. Uh, there'll be good, thorough, strong, learning opportunities provided. And then of course, the chair, him or herself, will get even a deeper sense of understanding. And then that individual, a, a big portion of that person's uh, responsibility is to help the team members come along. Because our goal is to, to have every one of the team members ultimately down the road, get to where they feel com comfortable and confident enough to serve as chairs as well. So that's, then we'd really know we'll really be genuine on all, all cycles at that point. So. In development of the OBT, each system is supposed to have one. It's the system's responsibility to find the OBT members. Uh, the variety of ways of doing that, there's some listed on the screen here. Uh, what I've been talking about is the other um, KSD, I don't know what I've been talking about on the screen, uh, has, is the service center piece here, uh, where all the people are being trained. And so we'd look regionally to help put together these teams. Uh, last I heard, we have over 500 people signed up for these trainings. That's great. We need more. So um, vote early, vote often. Get yourself signed up to become an OVT member, and then a district or a system would seek you out and say, hey, would you be willing to, ser to serve? In a perfect situation, this the black box, black circle in the middle here represents a school system. That individual school system will be made up of several different types of educators, people within the educational um, family. So a given system would have a building leader or two, a superintendent or two, a teacher or two, whatever it takes, whatever makes sense. So it might make perfect sense for a system to have three members on their team or seven members on their team. And, that's, and we, that, that, that has to do much more with size than anything else. So we're not dictating that every system has to have an OVT with all five of these boxes represented. That is not the case. Uh, it is possible for a system to have two people from higher ed and one teacher. That, that's possible if it fits the needs of that particular system. It's just the, the, the power of this slide is to represent we want many different voices and faces serving on the OVT from separate systems so that they're bringing together all the good thinking from different areas to come together to work with a given system. Uh, here are the reasons why to serve on an OVT. It's everything I've detailed before. You, you learn about others, you take things back home, and also you'll be able to advance your own professional development toward your licensing. Here's a real quick uh, surface level idea of what kinds of things take place during year one, two, three, four. The next slide will be year five. Uh, and you'll see here, yeah, we're looking at data uh, as it's being created. Uh, they're reviewing the progress of what's been going on. They, they engage in coaching with the individual system. It, it's, it's a five-year relationship. It's not a one-shot pony. It's when, when the team comes back in year three, they already have, they've already read the first two chapters of the book. And so there's an ongoing uh, dialogue that's taking place all leading to year five, which ultimately leads to the um, all the information being submitted to what is called the Accreditation Review Council, or otherwise known as ARC. And it's the ARC's responsibility on this slide here to make the final recommendation to the State Board of Education. So the ARC receives all these reports that come from the OVTs from across the state. 
And the arc then, after some really deep training, uh, will be able to sift through it and come up with a recommendation to the state board. Feel free to read the rest of the slide, of course, pause it and go back and read it. Uh, these are just some of the pragmatics of how it's to operate. Also this quarter, we are discussing uh, Indistar. Uh, there are a couple slides on here that kind of give you the broad strokes of Indistar. As you have questions, as we've put it up before, go to the top, upper right-hand corner, contact Doug, and he can give you the deep dive on it. We will have people out in the field during this quarter talking about you know, the virtues of Indistar and how it can help. Uh, basically, it's, it's a good way that, it, it, like it says here, it guides leadership teams in, uh, in improvement systems. And then, so you have a variety of different slides on here. And once again, the purpose of my time with you today is not to have everyone become gurus of Indostar but to, or Kansas Star, but to make sure you know that this opportunity does exist. So when you come out and pay attention at the workshops that we provide, you'll have opportunities to engage in deep dive conversations and or please feel free to contact Doug. Uh, more than willing, more than happy to help you out. So there's several slides around the Kansas Star and as it relates to KISA, as it all relates back, of course, to the um, vision and the outcomes and helping create high school graduates, productive high school graduates in the state of Kansas. So as is the case, this is running along, so I'm going to accelerate just a bit. Uh, the Every quarter we, we uh, would say it's a good idea to look at another rubric. So here's, if, you're, if you've paid attention to these in the past, just the this, just this representation of what it looks like. You familiarize yourself with you know, the writing of it, the um, logic model, if you will, of how these rubrics are put together. And the idea, of course, is to engage with your staffs to see where you land in a given R. Uh, there's no wrong answer, by the way. I mean, if you've, you have no evidence, that's just, it is what it is. You have no evidence. You're not getting a grade for that. Uh, if you're modeling, great. It is what it is. You're not getting a grade for that. Uh, the idea is to find out where you are, and then we move forward with it. And this is just a little way of thought process to help define whether you are in the, in the place of having no evidence, or if you think you're implementing, if you're transitioning, or if you're modeling. Of course, our ultimate goal is we'd love to have everybody modeling everything. But we understand. I mean, that's just not feasible. Uh, but so each system will dig into the area where they believe they need to spend, spend their, their time to help achieve all those goals we've discussed previously. I can't go through a, talk, a speaking engagement without talking about IRA, the inter rater agreement, the concept of that. And bottom dollar comes down to when two or more people are looking at something or reading something, they have a shared definition for that. Uh, and so it sounds real simple you start, until you start digging into it. So please avail yourself to these resources to help you with implementing quality IRA at home. Uh, this particular area deals with the discussion of results and data. And one of the, you know, the results, of course, are tied back to the outcomes, the state board outcomes. And one of those uh, is the individual plans of study. So here's information about the individual plans of study. I'm pretty sure most of you have heard about this by now. Uh, as you have questions, please contact Jay. He'd be glad to, to work with you to help you with your efforts in this particular area. Also, graduation rates, uh, one of our outcomes. Uh, it's important just to, to notate that it's, you know, it's one of the pieces. Uh, it's our outcome itself. Uh, as more definite ideas around that are being developed, we will be sure to get them out to you. At this stage of the game, just know that uh, this is an important factor within uh, accreditation. Also, uh, as all along we've been talking about the foundational pieces and the compliance pieces of accreditation, this particular quarter's time with the foundational, uh, deal with Rose Capacity 4, which deals with mental and physical health wellness. So then there's ideas down here as to things that should be taking place or have a plan to be taking place. If you look down here at the bottom, uh, it, it allows you to rate your system using these definitions. And so around physical education, around child nutrition, you know, so you can read these. And this has been growing throughout the rollout 
process we've been utilizing. Um, the other rose capacity we're a focus this particular quarter deals with the arts uh, and cultural and historical heritage. So this is where it shows up in the uh, guidance. And of course, it's the same sort of approach as the one previous. On the compliance types of things, you just if you're going to be a system in Kansas, an accredited system in Kansas, there are certain things you just have to have uh, that's following state and federal laws uh, and regulations, one of which is a curriculum. It'd be a good idea to have a curriculum. And here are the areas uh, within Kansas for our curriculum and the links where you could go to to get more information about those different curriculum areas. Jeanette Nobo would be the assistant director you might want to contact if you needed a little bit more information about this particular area. Uh, then, of course, we have assessments. If you're accredited, you'll be taking place. You'll be taking part in the assessments. Beth Foltz is your contact person. And I think most people know how the testing takes place in the state of Kansas. But here it is written out again for you as well. And here are some links for you to follow. All right, that's it. That's the third quarter. Um, like I said, this is published. This will be going live or going out on the website next Wednesday, I believe. And we are have our first speaking engagement out in the field next same day, next Wednesday, out in Sublette. Uh, and then a couple the next day in Eudora. And then it's really rolling at that point. Uh, we'd love to see you out in the field uh, to attend any, any or all these workshops, if you'd like. If that doesn't work in your schedule, please avail yourself of this particular a uh, hot topic for as many times as you want. Uh, there's no charge. It's free. And it gets better every time you listen to it. And then, of course, uh, do not hesitate to give me a holler if you have individual questions or just need a little bit more information. So with that, I'm signing off. And enjoy Kansas in January. Hello, this is Dean Zeitz, and I'm the state and federal fiscal coordinator here at the Kansas State Department of Education. And I'm here to give you this week's update on the Elementary and Secondary Education Act and the implementation of the Every Student Succeeds Act. Today's uh, discussion is going to be about the about evidence-based intervention and systems improvement. Um, as many of you know, evidence-based interventions um, is an old concept that, that's existed for a long time, but um, whereas before it was a best practice under the ESCA and No Child Left Behind, it is now and actually it's actually now a defined requirement under ESSA, uh, effective in the 2017-18 and beyond school year. And this is important for, for all of us uh, because whereas before this was just a, a best practice, it is now a re requirement that all of your interventions that are supplied out of uh, whether they're Title II teacher improvement, Title I school improvement, Title III, uh, whatever, um, that all of those interventions be evidence-based and um, be supported by a system of systemic improvement. So what does that mean? Evidence-based intervention, as defined now in the ESEA, um, updated ESEA, is that is uh, a system or an intervention that demonstrates a statistically significant effect on improving student outcomes or other relevant outcomes based on either strong evidence, moderate evidence, promising evidence, or demonstrates a rationale based on high quality research findings or positive evaluation that such activity or intervention is likely to improve student outcomes or other relevant outcomes. And it includes an ongoing effort to examine the effects of such activity. So what, what does all that mean? First of all, strong evidence. Strong evidence uh, is now defined under ESSA as an intervention that shows a statistically significant and positive effect of the intervention on a student's outcome or other relevant outcome. Um, and, and I'm not, I won't read the, read the entire uh, definition here because you can go back and, and look at it. But the important thing is that as you are choosing um, services and intervention models for your kiddos, you are considering um, whether or not they are in fact supported by existing um, systems of evidence um, or uh, a body of, of research that we'll talk about. And when we say that they're supported by strong evidence, um, 
where does that you need it needs we need to consider where that evidence is, is coming from who's doing the evaluation uh, i was at a, at a conference just a couple of weeks ago with a number of districts talking to them and you know one of them made a great point that your vendor for a product is probably not your best source for an unbiased uh, evaluation for the product uh, instead we want to look at existing research that's done by uh, universities or other outside third-party entities um, including the What Works Clearinghouse uh, WWC, which you will, there will be a link to at the end of this presentation. Uh, moderate evidence, uh, here again, uh, just a little bit different from, from the strong evidence, and I'm not going to read it all, but you can go back and, and, and actually read this, or you can read the full, um, the full explanation in the non-regulatory guidance for Title II that was released on September 27th. There again, a link to that uh, to that material is included at the end of this presentation. Promising evidence, um, and uh, finally demonstrates or demonstrates a rationale. Um, and I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about this one. So, the prior three uh, we're talking about addressed evidence, re i.e., research that's already been done to evaluate the effectiveness of a particular intervention. But as we know. Uh, some of the, the newest interventions and, and opportunities to improve outcomes for children may be something that is not yet tested. Uh, and so in those cases, what we want to look at is, uh, is a, an intervention that is at least informed on, uh, on rationale that is informed by research or an evaluation that suggests how the intervention is likely to improve the relevant outcomes and, and this is key, an effort to study the effects of the intervention uh, is included that will, as part of the intervention or that is being um, conducted elsewhere, um, evaluates the intervention to see if it's doing what it's supposed to do. Uh, because in all of this, there needs to be a cyclical frame framework for maximizing the results. Uh, whether you're using something that is evidence-based or that is still at the, uh, at the evidence-based rationale phase, you need to have a cyclical framework in order to uh, evaluate and continue to examine the results of the intervention within your district or within your building. Uh, the particular intervention really, it must be identified to align with your local needs, based, i.e. based on your, your local needs assessment, whether that's at the district level or at the building level, and that whatever that intervention is that you have the capacity, the local capacity to implement it. It may be the greatest thing since sliced bread, but if you don't have the staff and the, the resources to implement it, um, it will not be successful. Uh, that there is a robust implementation plan and that there are adequate resources to provide for the implementation. And finally, uh, that information needs to be gathered regularly to examine the strategy and reflect and inform next steps. So what does that last what does that last point mean? That means that it's not enough to choose your implement to choose your intervention and implement it. You need to also have a system by which you are gathering information and evaluating that information throughout the implementation of the strategy to verify that it is in fact having the the impact that it is designed to have. Um, and a, a, a prime example of this is a, a research paper that was released just in the last few months um, in which a, that evaluated a, uh, a uh, particular program, in a, and it, this was in another state, but it was an examination of a particular program to uh, reduce uh, teenage births in which the a, a series of districts implemented a program that um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, you know, where you have the, the egg that you take care of like a, like a baby. Well, it was a particular doll that, that was created to mimic uh, a baby, a human baby. And the idea of this multi-year um, study was to evaluate whether or not the program actually reduced the number of, of teenage births for the children, for the kids that, that participated in that, in that program. And through that systemic study, what they found was that, in fact, not only did it not reduce the number of, of, of teenage births, there was actually a negative uh, impact um, by, this, by this program. The program actually, for the kiddos that participated in the program, they actually had an increase, uh, a, statistically in, a statistic increase in the, uh, in the number of, of 
teenage births um, as compared to the, the control group. So this is why it is important that we actually measure um, our, 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 our strategies to make sure that they are working and so that we can go back and, and adjust, examine, and tweak if, if possible or, um, or look at a different intervention. Uh, the cyclical framework for improvement, this is just kind of a graphical analysis of what we just talked about. But here again, uh, I want to point out that that center circle that, you know, as you go through the identify local needs, select the approach, come up with a plan, implement, examine and reflect. Throughout that process, we want to be consulting with our stakeholders, whether that's parents, uh, your teachers, uh, you know, those, those different uh, elements that should play a part of the, of the process. And finally, uh, we wanted to say that the move to evidence-based interventions and, and systemic improvement, you know, again, this is not new for many of you. Mo many of you are already doing this, and it is the, the concepts of, of evidence-based interventions and systemic improvement are built into the core of many of the existing Kansas initiatives that are, that are out there, whether that's the Kansas uh, Education Systems Accreditation, the Kansas MTSS, Kansas Star, uh, et, et cetera. And so we, we're including resources here um, to those existing initiatives. If, if you have questions, you can certainly take a look at those. And then finally, some additional resources that are more specific to the, the strategies and evidence and, and best practices surrounding both evidence-based interventions and the systemic improvement process. Um, and of course, if you have any questions, um, you can always refer them here to the uh, to to our team here at the Early Childhood and Special Education Title Services team, or or anyone else here at the Kansas State Department of Education. Uh, this has just been an overview of evidence-based interventions and systemic improvement, but uh, be assured that there will be some additional um, and more in-depth guidance and uh, technical assistance made available throughout the year as, as we learn more about uh, the implementation of ESSA and, and in particular um, in time for our uh, next year's uh, leadership conferences. Thank you. Greetings, this is Barb Dale from the Early Childhood Special Education and Title Services Division. I work with our early learning team, including special education for three to five year olds, as well as our state pre-K, formerly known as the four-year-old at risk programs. I've been asked today to talk about early learning in Kansas. So where are we now and where are we headed? Many of you have probably heard about the State Board of Education's initiative around kindergarten readiness. If you haven't had a chance to watch Dr. Watson's short video on this subject, I would really encourage you to do so. When we talk about kindergarten readiness, we're really talking about how can schools be ready for children. We know in Kansas the only requirement to enter kindergarten is to be five years old. We also know that many of our children are not as ready as they could be to start school. So the purpose of our kindergarten readiness initiative is not to screen children out. It's to let us know how we can better prepare children for school and also to give teachers more information on the children coming into their classrooms. We also need to look at the quality of our early learning programs. What does quality look like in early learning settings? And how do we align our early learning programs to K-12? Here's some of the early learning programs we currently have in Kansas. Of course, children are in many other settings, such as in-home and center-based childcare and private preschools. Some districts have figured out ways to blend some of these together in one classroom, and others continue to run separate classrooms. So how well do we really collaborate in early learning? The recent authorization of Head Start program performance standards and the CCDF require collaboration with other agencies in the community, such as Part B and Part C and community programs. This is essential since our children are in multiple settings, sometimes all in one day. They may attend a morning Head Start, an afternoon state pre-K and go on to daycare. We really must move forward with aligning our programs to get consistent outcomes for children. So how do we improve quality? 
We need to begin aligning our early learning programs birth through age eight. We need vertical alignment, which would be aligning from grade to grade. We also need horizontal alignment. So aligning these programs to other programs. For example, aligning our Kansas early learning standards to Head Start standards. What does quality look like? Looking at what is developmentally appropriate is not just for preschool, but for kindergarten and up. Dr. Watson emphasized that the purpose of kindergarten readiness is not to push academics down from first grade into kindergarten. That is not developmentally appropriate. Curriculum and assessments must truly be designed for that specific age. Too many programs attempt to modify a kindergarten curriculum to preschool, for example, because that's what's been purchased by the district. But the vendor may not have had an actual curriculum for preschool. It's also not acceptable to use screening or assessment tools designed for an upper grade, for example, in preschool. Professional learning needs to collaborate with community programs. Children's atten children attending a community program will one day be in your district. You may be serving special education children in a community program. It can only benefit everyone to include these partners whenever possible. Be sure to include administrators in professional learning around developmentally appropriate practices and early learning if they don't have that expertise. Universal Design for Learning is a really important tool to assist with inclusion of all children. The National Association of State Directors of Special Ed, NASD, has come out with guiding principles for IDEA reauthorization and mentions UDL more than once. What do quality programs look like? You probably shouldn't see drill and kill and you need to be careful about long periods of whole group activities, especially with younger children. Teacher interactions are crucial. There are many good observational tools available to assess how this is going in a classroom. There should be lots of language, conversations, not all teacher talk, asking open-ended questions, dialogic reading strategies, to name a few. How do we reduce gaps and increase achievement? We need to create a culturally sensitive program to match the child's culture. Each individual family's culture could look different. We need to include family in a meaningful way as partners. We need to address the disparity in exposure to language, which is a fundamental component in literacy development. Exposure to language is significantly different in low-income families. Children can hear far fewer words and are engaged in fewer conversations. We also need to develop comprehensive standards that align across developmental stages, age, and grade levels. This is taken from the Zero to Three website, and this illustrates the word gap based on socioeconomic status. So for example, in an economically advantaged home, children may have up to 1,100 words in their vocabulary by age three, as opposed to those in a more disadvantaged home might only have 500. So where are we headed? And why do we consider birth through age eight early childhood? This is a quote taken from the National Association for the Education of Young Children, or NACI. So we know research is more and more showing us that the effects of quality birth through five programs will diminish if kindergarten and up are not also quality and developmentally appropriate. KSDE will be rolling out our new early learning fact sheet soon, as well as more information on what quality looks like in programs birth through age eight. And also look for information coming out on our upcoming road trips. So you will see on an early learning fact sheet this mission statement. To prepare Kansas students birth through age eight for lifelong success through rigorous quality academic instruction, career training, and career character development according to each student's gifts and talents. You will also see our vision statement. KSDE's vision for developmentally appropriate environments 
means that every infant, toddler, preschooler, kindergartner, first, second, and third grader is in a learning environment where teachers and caregivers know where they're headed. They have clear standards and goals. Teachers and caregivers plan meaningful learning experiences. They use a variety of effective teaching strategies informed by data. For example, observations, work samples, family input, <clears throat> to best meet the needs of each child in the classroom. Teachers and caregivers individualize rigorous instruction and learning experiences to best meet the needs of each child in every environment. So again, why should we align our programs from birth to age eight? For one thing, early childhood and K through 12 can really learn from each other. Administrators may not be knowledgeable about early childhood. There's often a lack of quality in early childhood programs in a community, so they can benefit from collaborating with school districts. And also, again, we know that gains made in those early learning programs will diminish if the other programs, K through third, are not also quality. To summarize, we need a connected, coherent birth through elementary framework. And we can achieve this continuity through alignment of our standards, curriculum, and data collection. This is a list of some resources, especially joint policy statements that have come out in the last year from both Department of Ed and Health and Human Services. So I would encourage you to take a look at these. Here's my contact information and also Vera Strap Rontier, who is an assistant director here and is very involved with our early learning programs, as well as Tammy Mitchell, another assistant director, and is also involved with our kindergarten readiness initiative. Thank you and have a great day.